Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us here at the virtual Princeton Public Library. My name is Nora, and I'm part of the program team, and we are joined tonight by historian, journalist, and author Robert Strauss, discussing his book, John Marshall, The Final Founder, about the life and legacy of John Marshall. He is joined in conversation with James Schneider, a former student and a member of the Princeton University Press. We are very pleased to have them both here with us. Um, a few quick logistics. We are recording tonight's presentation, so it will be available following the event. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we would love if you would put those in the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen, and we will get to those toward the end of the presentation. We also have the chat open. If you'd like to leave a comment, um, you can address those to um, all panelists and attendees if you'd like everyone to be able to see it. So before we start also the, um, the book, John Marshall, The Final Founder is available through our partner Labyrinth Books for a discount. I'm going to put that information in the chat so um, you can access that. I will put it again at the end of the program. So. Strauss is a freelance journalist who has taught, who has, I think, more than 1,000 bylines in the New York Times. He has taught nonfiction writing at the University of Pennsylvania since 1999 and has been an adjunct profess professor at Temple University, the University of Delaware, and St. Joseph's University. He is the author of Worst President Ever, among other books, which you can see behind his shoulder there. In the book tonight, uh, Strauss recounts how the Chief Justice acted as the glue that held the union together after the original founding days. The Supreme Court met in the basement of the new Capitol building in Washington when Marshall took over, which is indicative of what the executive and legislative branches thought of the judiciary at the time. John Marshall, the final founder, advocates a change in the view of when the founding of the United States ended. I'm going to turn that things over now to Robert Strauss and James Snyder for tonight's presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us. All right, James, it's up to you. <laughs> that, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's really great to be in conversation with uh, Robert Strauss, who I, I know as Strauss affectionately uh, for about 20 years uh, since I took his nonfiction writing class and he gave me an A minus. Um, not that, not that I hold any kind of grudge. That's a good grade from him. Anyway, um, I'm really excited to, um, to talk to Strauss about this book because it's a fun book and history, history can, be, uh, can be dates and it can be definitive. Um, this is a history that's meant to be fun and um, they're sort of uh, you know, interesting asides and sort of uh, you, you'll, you'll see there's a, a lot of uh, humor that's that's brought to the text, and also a lot of um, a lot of deep thought. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, kick things off with with an easy one, hopefully, which is um, why did you go for Marshall after the worst president ever, James Buchanan? Why did you turn to him as a subject? Okay, well, the, the worst president ever uh, book uh, came about because I wanted to write about somebody who wasn't uh, well, you know, wasn't the hero. With many uh, presidential biographies sort of started in after uh, World War II when we thought we had enough presidents to write about, and uh, uh, Buchanan didn't get written about by by many, I would have to say. But but beyond that, he 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 gave us a chance. He gave us a chance to look at the other side, and that is, uh, I hesitate to call it failure. But but non success would be would be uh, the term anyway. So so my uh, wanted like the the response we got, which was fun, and, and uh, um, they wanted another uh, uh, biography. And uh, though I had suggested Henry Clay, they came back and said, you know, there have been no biographies of Henry Clay that have sold much, and I thought. James Buchanan, you know, anyway, so they were willing to publish that. But anyway, when I came up with Marshall, uh, uh, it was sort of, it was sort of uh, uh, fortuitous. I wanted somebody who was uh, well known to historians at any rate and, and, and a significant player. But uh, the fortuitous part was that he was more interesting than I had thought. 
And now that I've gone through it, I often say that if Lynn Miranda had picked up a biography of Marshall instead of his biography of, uh, of uh, uh, Hamilton, the musical would have been Marshall with three exclamation points because Marshall was really the, uh, the uh, uh, Forrest Gump of the founders. He was everywhere from Valley Forge onward. He was everywhere and in different things and with a lot of panache. So, and we'll get to that. Um, you, you, we certainly will. And I, 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 I love that you've already touched on a pop culture, which is a, a string throughout the book. Sports are also a, a big part of the book. I think uh, um, kind of interesting uh, as you're a former uh, sports writer. Um, one of the funny musings that you have, which I, I think is just a, a, a great statement, is that uh, at the time it wasn't hard to be a founder. Could you explain that? Right. Okay. So uh, recently, I've been looking at the uh, uh, census uh, reports of the first three censuses, 1790, 1800, and 1810. Uh, now they're a little beyond, of course, 1776, but, but let's take 1790 to be more or less 1776 or more or less a founder time. And uh, at that time, there were 3.8 million people in the United States. Now, a lot of them were slaves, a lot of them were women, a lot of them were kids. And so there were only 780,000 uh, white men over 16. So you can even take a, a, a larger number out of that. So when you think about that, and they were spread all around, and America was sort of a rural uh, country. There were only five places that had more than 10,000 people in them. Now, that's pretty amazing, right, to have a country in the 1790s. Uh, and those five places were, of course, Philadelphia, New York, which were far and above everybody else. And the other three were Baltimore, Boston, and Charleston, which had barely over 10,000 people. Now, I live in Haddonfield, New Jersey, which has 11,000 people. So there were only five places bigger than my minuscule little town. Uh, um, so there weren't that many people vying to be a founding father. They're out in boondock. Now, the other thing about the country is that, unlike today, Virginia was by far the largest state. They had 21% of the population of the United States. So a fifth of the people were, were uh, from Virginia. So you had a leg up if you were from Virginia to be a founder, right? You, you, you know a lot of them. I mean, even in, in passing, you know, Washington, Madison, Monroe, you know, Patrick Henry, Jefferson, you know, we're all founders. Uh, Adams uh, said that he had to pick, he had to uh, pick Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence in their little a uh, cadre of five people that went there, Ben Franklin, two others, uh, because if a Virginian wrote it, people would buy into it, right? So that would sort of uh, speak for Marshall. Uh, Marshall's road to being a founder was uh, was probably not a regular one, but uh, but we can get into that too. But but my my point is that the the numbers were such that. If you had a little gumption, you didn't have to be rich, but if you had a little gumption, you could have been at the center of the uh, beginning of the country. And early, relatively early on, before he becomes the, the Chief Justice famously, he is at one point both the Secretary of State and Chief Justice. How does that happen? Yes. Well, you know, here, here we, have a, we have a country that, that, that you know, it says, oh, the founders said this, the founders meant that. Well, the founders did a lot of things, even governmentally, I'm not talking about or anything. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, let's, let's just say, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip his, uh, his uh, resume, but, but he, Marshall becomes a, uh, a, a player in the Federalist Party. He was, he was, uh, he, he, he was the a key member of the uh, legislature in, in, well, the Constitutional Convention in, in Virginia that, that uh, ratified the Constitution. They were, in fact, the 10th state to ratify 
There, there were only the, the Constitution said as soon as nine people, nine states ratified it, they would have a country. Well, let me tell you, without Virginia and New York, there was going to be no country. And Virginia and New York were the 10th and 11th states to ratify, and they were both very close, despite Hamilton and Madison and, and Marshall, who led the, who led the uh, uh, debate against Patrick Henry, who was uh, uh, not for it. So, uh, uh, so now we get to have a country. Uh, uh, North Carolina and, and Rhode Island sort of drift off and, 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 and don't uh, ratify for a while, but they are not as important as Virginia and New York. So the country gets started, and, and uh, uh, Washington uh, is the president by almost by acclamation. Everybody wanted Washington to be president, even people who didn't particularly like him. They realized that he was the man who was going to move them forward. Uh, so uh, anyway, the Federalists uh, uh, go along, and they win the first three elections, Washington twice and Adams once. And this, as Adams is finishing his first term and running against Jefferson for uh, president, uh, oddly enough, you know, of course, the, the uh, Adams, uh, Jefferson was the vice president and not of the same party because of a quirk in the original constitution that's since been rectified. But the election of 18, well, uh, as uh, uh, Adams finds that his Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State was more like uh, the Chief of Staff. Now, what's funny is that uh, uh, at the time, in the Adams administration, Secretary of State had five people working for him. And we think about the bureaucracy, you know, they were able to run it with five people. Maybe we can do that again. But in, in any case, uh, but he's, he's like the Chief of Staff. He's sort of the, the head of the cabinet in some way. Because it was not the, the what what's become Secretary of State is, is of course the head of foreign relations pretty much now. In, in any case, uh, uh, the Adams, uh, contemporary uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, they, he found that he was uh, he was uh, uh, snitching to Hamilton about whatever everything was doing. So he fires, him. and he takes on Marshall, who had been offered other jobs by Washington, but generally uh, uh, stayed in Congress instead. Uh, so Marshall becomes Secretary of State late in the Adams administration. At this point, they've uh, decided where Washington, D.C. is going to be, but it isn't being built very well, uh, very quickly. And Adams hates the hot weather. He starts, he goes down there, uh, with the Capitol partially built and the White House partially built. And he says, I'm going home to Massachusetts. John, you take over. So Marshall is, is, is in fact, the general contractor of Washington, D.C. He, he, he's probably the first person to sleep in the White House because he's got really nowhere to go. There's a, there's a, a little hotel that he could stay at, but he, he's got to be up to supervise the projects. And, and, and as you know, the, the, the White House and the Capitol were pretty close to one another. And most of it, what was in between was a little rivulet that, that was filled with sewage. And, and uh, uh, no wonder Adams didn't, didn't want to stay there. He wanted to get out of the, you know, the other thing about Adams, I can tell you this, for seven months one year, he stayed in Quincy. We're worrying about Trump golfing and, and, and George Bush going on this uh, ranch. I mean, this was a guy who was out of touch. You know, he wrote letters, I'm sure. There was no, uh, there was no social media. I grew social media, I guess, for letters. And, and in any case, so uh, uh, in this time period, the Supreme Court was really sort of not anything. John Jay was the first Supreme Court Chief Justice. In the first uh, term of the Supreme Court, there was one case and it, and it was uh, uh, settled before arguments. So really no cases. Uh, 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 at some point, Washington sends Jay off to England to, to uh, broker a, 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 a second peace treaty. So imagine that. The, 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 essentially the em uh, emissary to, uh, uh, from the executive branch is over there, even though it's Supreme Court Chief Justice, and there's nobody here. 
to take his place. Uh, same thing happens to the third Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Ellsworth. He's, uh, they send him off to France to, to bring another deal to keep the Barbary pirates from, from robbing our ships. Uh, but he gets stuck in France and he gets sick and he can't make the boat over. So he sends a message on the boat, which of course takes two months to get there, six weeks, sometime like that, uh, to uh, Adams says, you gotta appoint somebody else. It's not gonna be me. I'm not gonna get back. I, I don't really even want the job. So Marshall meets with him as Secretary of State and he says, uh, he has a few ideas, Jay being one to bring him back. And, and uh, uh, Adams in, in, uh, says instead, no, I think it'll be you. So Marshall gets to be both Secretary of State and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And most people are associating him with uh, most people are associating him with being the Supreme Court justice, and you know he he really does set the stage for everything that's to come, and really builds up the third branch of government. Um, but the the most famous case, I, I think, one could argue, Marbury versus Madison. Um, he probably shouldn't have taken that. Why is that? Yes. Okay. So it, it's coming to the end. Uh, 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 Anybody that's seen Hamilton knows that there's a, there's a, the election of 1800 is, uh, it, it tends to be, it ends up being a brokered one because uh, uh, Jefferson and his running mate, alleged running mate, Aaron Burr, end up with the same number of electoral votes. Now, Adams always seeded things. I mean, he, didn't, he didn't reach Washington's vote total, but he seeded things to uh, Washington and, and, and Jefferson to Adams. But Burr says, hmm, you know, this is a chance for me, right? So uh, it goes into the House of Representatives where it continues to get tie votes, tie vote, tie vote. And back, in, back then, uh, you know, the election was in November and the, the uh, uh, inauguration was March 4th. Well, now we're into February, a continual tie vote. Uh, some people say that Marshall, they want, want Marshall to be an interim president. But then other people say, no, nope, sorry, we don't want that. Uh, you know, who knows what he'll do. And uh, uh, eventually they, uh, they it, it, it's almost a bribe to the, to the Delaware representative to give his father-in-law a judgeship. Uh, and that, even though he was a Federalist, votes for, uh, votes for Jefferson. Uh, so Jefferson is gonna be president. Now, what you have going out is the Federalists have the presidency and both uh, houses of Congress. It, it, on March 4th, there's going to be a, a, a Republican or a Jeffersonian president and two, uh, two uh, houses of Congress of his party. Well, isn't this a fine how do do? Because so uh, uh, the Federalists decide we only got one shot here and that's going to be the, the judiciary. And they, uh, in after this election, so in other words, in the last couple of weeks of, the, of Adams's term, they appoint a slew of federal judgeships uh, in the 40s. And so Marshall, <laughs> he, may be, he may be Supreme Court Chief Justice, but he's also Secretary of State. So he's got to write up all these commissions, right? And, and deliver them by March 4th. Well, March 3rd, he's still out there doing this. And there's a, there's a, he, he, there, there are reports that the, the incoming uh, undersecretary of state is sitting there like, you know, with a watch. Of course, they don't have watches. But anyways, was waiting. Uh, uh, and at midnight, you know, John, that's it. You're done, right? So, so one of these uh, commissions goes out to a guy named William Marbury. And William Marbury is an operator. What's great about the, even the great cases is the facts somehow get jarred with the principle that the, that the uh, court wants to do. So in any case, Marbury is sort of, like I say, a servant operator. He gets a little commission from uh, 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 finding the uh, site for the, uh, the, the, the naval building or the head of the Navy uh, in Washington. He has a little uh, uh, lottery going. And, and so 
he's going to be justice of the peace in Washington. Not the only justice of the peace in Washington. Now, Washington's got like a thousand people, most of whom clear out in the summer, as, as we've seen. So it's really sort of a nothing job. But Marbury wants it, and he didn't get his commission. It didn't get delivered to him one time. So uh, he, he uh, sues James Madison, the new Secretary of State, for not giving him the commission. In any case, the, uh, the uh, Republicans now come in. Now, we worry about six to three, right, in this Supreme Court. If you're a, if you're a liberal, you, you hate it. And if you're a conservative, you love it, right? But it's still six to three, and it's many other federal judges. Well, when Jefferson takes over, there are nothing but federalist judges, because there's only been federalist presidents nominating them. Imagine every judge, every federal judge in the United States is a federalist. So uh, the, the Jeffersonians try to at least do something. And what they do is they, they uh, uh, we configure the the dates of the uh, Supreme Court of the, the Supreme Court sitting, and they delay it by fourteen months. But meanwhile, Marshall is thinking about this case that Bill Marbury has taken uh, against uh, uh, Madison, and it's not that he really cares about Marbury, but what he does care about is he's seen the opening. You know, Washington has this opening to, to, to be president and decide what pres the presidency is going to be. But Marshall sees this opening and he sees how the, the court can be different, how, you know, and, and how it can uh, uh, operate in a, in, a, in a completely different way than any court in any other uh, semi-democracy. Um, so... And he sees something in this Marbury versus Madison case. Now it's sitting there, right? And finally, the the, the court gets to meet, and he has to wait till there's a a, a, a quorum. And there are six justices. Now, who has six? Who has an even number of justices? I, I mean, you know, Alexander Hamilton, you know, decides you know, that that there has to be. There's a certain number of justices, and everybody sort of agrees with six. Well, how are you ever going to get a majority, right? Everything's, everything could be three to three, right? But, but if one of the justices can't make it to Philadelphia, excuse me, Washington. He's sick. So now there's five, right? So now there's five to decide this case. And unfortunately, one of them is stuck in the hotel. Uh, Marshall decides that. He wants all of his, uh, the Supreme Court to stay in one hotel, to have a collegial kind of uh, uh, court. And, and the other thing is he decides that there will be, no, there will be one decision. In other words, if it's, if it's uh, five to one, four to two, whatever it is, it's going, we're all going to get behind it. Because the next time your side will have it. Uh, and and he, want, he wanted this, this uh, body that, that was sort of like James had said was sitting in the basement of the Capitol to, to have a bigger uh, sense of itself and the sense of power and by by binding them all together he thought he could do that in any case the, uh, uh, what happens as, as they're doing oral arguments uh, one of the other justices gets has a case of gout and he can't get out so they can't have a quorum because he can't get to the Supreme Court basement. By the way, in that basement, uh, on on many Saturdays, there are dances because what does Washington have in the first couple of years of its existence? And on Sunday, there's church services. Can you imagine that the, happening now in the Capitol, right? Uh, so so uh, anyway, what Marshall says, okay, you know, he, got, he has a uh, Mohammed to the mountain moment and uh, or whatever it is and he decides that we're going to hear this case in the hotel in the hotel lobby where where the justice can get downstairs and have a quorum so this is the greatest case in supreme court history the signal case and it's held in a hotel lobby and it's been delayed for 14 months and 
you know, here's the thing. Who's responsible for Marbury not getting his commission? John Marshall. If he had, if he had written it and delivered it, he could have hand-delivered it himself. <laughs> but, but he, as Secretary of State, was responsible for this. He should have obviously, uh, uh, well, you know, not heard the case. Nonetheless, this is the way things work. And uh, the other thing Marshall would do is he would also give a sop to the other side. He would always have something for both sides to have. So in this case of Marbury versus Madison, uh, he, he decides that, uh, uh, that the big thing that he wants to decide is that the Supreme Court can review a law, can review uh, anything that happens between the federal government and, uh, and uh, uh, an individual, the federal government and the states, the states and the other states, uh, uh, and uh, uh, branches of the federal government itself. So he decides, in a circuitous thing that I'm not going to get to, that the, uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is invalid because it's a, it, it, it doesn't say that the uh, uh, Supreme Court can decide a case. And uh, he, he interprets the uh, Constitution as saying that it can. And the sop he gives to the other side, he says, but because it was invalid, uh, uh, Secretary of State Madison is quite within his rights not to give Marbury his job. So big deal. They, you know, there's there's a, a, a justice of the peace uh, doesn't doesn't make it. But yet now Marshall has ruled, and that uh, he can, uh, well, the Supreme Court can nullify any law or at least pass judgment on it, and that. Uh, that tends to put him at odds with uh, Thomas Jefferson, his second cousin. Right, because everyone, because ever, everyone was so close at that time, and uh, it was yeah. easy to be a founder. Um, and so I'm, I'm uh, curious also about um, with with his death. You, um, you, you note that um, that there's a, a myth that has um, has persisted for a long time and even into um, a rather famous biography of Marshall. And I'm, I'm curious if you could uh, sort of um, lay out this story of, um, of how he died and what happened and, you know, what the myth surrounding that was. Right. Uh, well, I, I, I love to, uh, uh, I talk about myth in this. I, I, one of the things about my book is that it's a biography. But I use it as a jumping off point to all these little stories that I like about American history and, and uh, it's somehow vaguely related to, uh, to Marshall. But, but I, I think they're fun stories. I like fun in histories. Uh, this and so, so Marshall uh, uh, sits for 35 years. I, I say he's the final founder. He's the final working founder. Uh, James Madison and Aaron Burr lived longer, but they were you know, in retirement in their, in their, uh, in Washington and, uh, excuse me, in, in New York and, and Virginia. Uh, but Marshall is still sitting <laughs> and uncomfortably sitting from Richmond to Philadelphia to go to his doctor because he's got stones, kidney stones, gallstones, all sorts of stones. And, uh, you know, imagine bounding all the way from Richmond. This is not I-95, by the way. This is uh, this takes several days, in a, even in a carriage, and you know the stones <laughs> in him. So he finally gets to uh, Philadelphia to his doctor. Uh, those of you know Philadelphia, he, he, he was in Pennsylvania Hospital, the the the, the one that exists in Center City today, and uh, um, uh, he. He, they they take the stones out. The 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 the, the uh, some of the papers say there are a thousand stones, but it doesn't matter. There's a lot, and he in his recovery, of course, what they did was they bled him, they bleached him, and he died. Who knows whether he died from the operation or the post operation? Uh, nonetheless, uh, there's this long-standing myth. I guess to be, if you have a myth that's longstanding, then you are somebody, right? So Marshall's somebody because of this myth. And uh, it's that the Liberty Bell 
uh, rang upon his death, you know, his mourning, and uh, that uh, the crack happened then, and that uh, it rang for the last time then. Uh, and this, you know, this particular biography starts out with this, but it gives, it has voluminous footnotes, but none for this little uh, anecdote that I've just told you. Well, 0 for 3. Uh, the, the bell was in, was in the state, the state house, what we call Independence Hall, and it, it was all, already sort of immobilized. Uh, you know, they, it, it had started becoming more famous as the Liberty Bell. I, I don't know whether its name had become the Liberty Bell yet, but the abolitionists sort of took it over as their symbol. Uh, and it, like I said, it become immobilized up in the tower. People could see it, but it, 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 it didn't ring. Uh, or wasn't wrong. Uh, second of all, most people who have even uh, thought of the Liberty Bell know that the crack happened long before 1835. And, uh, and finally, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, the, the Liberty Bell went on a couple of uh, road trips around the country. And at each place, they rang it, either with the clapper or, or banging the bell. So, the myth is more valuable to those who like Marshall. Uh, of course, George Washington has better myths, uh, you know, with the wooden teeth and uh, cherry trees. Uh, but uh, uh, Marshall was, you know, he to uh, to people who were lawyers, he's the big deal. He's the big cheese. Uh, uh, the, Amy Barrett got to sit in Marshall's chair when she was. Uh, uh, you know, sworn in to the uh, to the uh, Supreme Court. Every every new justice gets to sit in his chair. That's the big deal. Anyway, there you go. Next question. No, sorry. <laughs> no, um, I I'm gonna turn it over shortly to uh, audience questions. So hopefully some can uh, appear in the chat soon. I just wanted to share one of my favorite lines um, from from the book, which is. Uh, which just sort of like captures who, who Marshall was in an interesting way. It's, uh, it's, it's near the end of chapter nine. If there's a time that the nation was finally in its proper form, the end of the founding, it was when Marshall's courage made what would seem a trivial case about a few probably unnecessary jobs into something that would transform democracy throughout the world by asserting that there was a judiciary that could negate unfair or non-constitutional laws, the decision brought the federal courts to the equality they had to wait for after the initial phase of the founding. Once it was there, with the Marshall decision, the founding could be said to be over, and the rest, as the ancient Jewish dictum goes, is commentary. I just think that captures so well like who John Marshall was. Um, but uh, before we turn it over finally to um, to audience questions, I wanted to um, to ask about some of the the riffs you go on, and and uh, maybe you could speak about um, the the worst justice ever or the worst decision ever or some some of these um, sort of um, spinoff um, aspects that are not quite biography that um, that that do um, you know they do help explain the story. Well, the the worst justice ever was probably James McReynolds. He was a uh, he was a, he was a, a, a Will, President Wilson, speaking of Princeton, uh, President Wilson's uh, attorney general. And he was a, a, a confirmed anti-Semite, white supremacist, misogynist. You know, he, he had all three. And, and uh, uh, he was, and he was also aggravating. He would always uh, come to, Wilson and and have some minor uh, issue, and, and Wilson just really hated him, and apparently uh, uh, nominated him to the Supreme Court so he would get out of his hair. You know that's sort of the thought. And uh, Taft, who was the Chief Justice then, could not say anything nice about this guy. Uh, uh, one of the things he did is finally. Uh, a Jewish uh, uh, justice came, came uh, uh, well, two, uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, he, uh, he would not listen to what they would have to say. He would put either put a newspaper up or walk out. Uh, if a, a woman 
was uh, was trying a case before the Supreme Court, he would walk out, uh, and uh, uh, you know his his uh, dissents were voluminous, and they were mostly about uh, the New Deal. Uh, he was a, a dissenter, uh, uh, even of Social Security. Uh, he when he uh, when he died, he would, the one thing he did, the most positive thing he did as a Supreme Court justice was getting rid of smoking in the, in the chambers. So, you know, that was his big, big uh, positive thing. But in any case, when he died, nobody came to his funeral. Uh, uh, no, no Supreme Court uh, justice came to his funeral and uh, nobody from uh, the Wilson administration either. So uh, he was, you think about justices of the modern day, and, and none of them uh, uh, compare to him. So, what what about the the worst case? The worst case is is uh, hands down the Dred Scott case. Uh, it was uh, it was the only other one up to that point, other than Marbury versus Madison, that actually struck down a law. And it struck down the compromises of 1820 and 1850. Missouri Compromise was one of them that you've heard of, uh, the 1820 Compromise. But uh, uh, what there's a longer story to this with James Buchanan uh, affecting this. But, but some of the substance of this uh, is that Dred Scott was a slave to a, a, a Missouri uh, 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 army officer at some point during his uh, uh, time in the army, the officer went to uh, what is now Minnesota, uh, came back, and at some point, uh, Dred Scott's, after the, the, that man dies, uh, and he's being transferred to another part of his family, uh, Scott says, I'm a free man because I was a free man. I could have been a free man in Minnesota. And uh, uh, you know, even though I've been enslaved, uh, I, I should be free. So the, the decision by Roger Tawney, who was a slaveholder himself, uh, said that this is 1857 now, uh, said that uh, not only was uh, not only was he ruling against this, but he said that he uh, uh, Dred Scott had no standing. No black man had standing to sue there was never there was never uh, uh they couldn't no state could outlaw slavery because there's no provision for it in the uh, constitution so uh, uh the future slave law became uh, valid again every uh, slavery was uh, essentially uh, a good anywhere and that's that you know, it, it brought it, it brought turmoil to uh, to the United States, it caused a, a severe, quick uh, uh, depression, much like the COVID did uh, under Trump. Uh, it uh, it invalidated to 20 years of growth, mostly due to railroads. Many railroads failed, uh, uh, and uh, 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 you know led to basically led to the Civil War. At that point, the, the sides became so uh, energized for each other. The, the the abolitionists gained uh, a, a reason to uh, to be in a sense. So um, that's the word. There's there's a question that picks up on this, and I don't know if um, if Nora is going to ask it or if I should. Okay. You I was say you can go right ahead, but I'll ask it since I'm so. Um, how do you how do you define the worst? The question asks. McReynolds was a miserable human being, but wrote a number of important decisions. How do you compare him to Taney, who wrote Dred Scott? Right. Okay. Well, you can, you know, it's not as if uh, uh, Taney wasn't wasn't among the worst in that sense, but he did. He was the, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's true that best and worst is 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 how you color it. You know, when when I would go around and and uh, I remember being at Penn, where uh, 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 James is a, a graduate. And I'm speaking about the, the worst president ever. And, and there's this woman next to me who was silent. And suddenly he, she, I, I say, I got a call on her because she's like looking at me as if I'm a, 
uh, you, you know, uh, evil incarnate. And she says, George Bush. And I think like, all right, you know, that's your decision. You know, it, it, these things are not immutable. They're just what I, what I have uh, determined that I think it is. Now, there, there are what I, what in the chapter where I, I talk about the worst uh, the, the Supreme Court decisions, uh, I start off with an anecdote about uh, uh, people, there's some people who would say that uh, Marbury versus Madison was the worst decision, you know, because it, 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 judicial review shouldn't happen. The states should do whatever they want to do, or the federal, you know, the, if, if there's a, a, a it shouldn't be uh, these nine people uh, uh, invalidating a law. So it's all in how you look at it. Um, we do want to encourage you to please ask questions if you have them at this time. I'm using the Q&A button or popping them in the chat. Either is fine. Um, while people collect their thoughts, um, I wanted to ask your um, sort of your personal history with Marshall. When did um, like when did you first kind of become interested in him as a historical figure? Is that is he somebody who's kind of been with you for a long time, or did you kind of come to him later? I came to him later, but I I, I always enjoyed. I always like to be contrary. I saw my cousin Seth Melman is here, and he'll he's since he's known me uh, about sixty five years, he can valid, validate my uh, contrariness. And uh, uh, when when I determined that not many people had written about him, and almost nobody had written about him the way I wanted to write about him, with all the little, you know, if, if people get the book, they'll see all these little fun sort of things like his courting of his wife starting at her age 13 and one of the things where when he he at that point he starts going to what is to all intents and purposes law school he's re reading with a with a uh a, a, a legal scholar at william and mary and like a junior high girl on his notes are uh her name was polly amblin uh, Elizabeth Amwood, but Polly, P A N J M, you know, Mrs. Polly Marshall. Just the same way he would be, you know, like I said, I mean, I don't know if you did it when you were in junior high, but, but, you know, that's my, uh, my equivalent. <laughs> don't tell anybody. But, but, uh, uh, and, and just uh, uh, being a 22 year old and courting a 13 year old. You know, really, and then I, I find out. You know, I was listening to uh, 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 a CD of uh, uh, the correspondence between the Adamses, uh, John and Abigail, and he started dating her when he was about twenty-three, and she was fifteen. You know, Marquis de Lafayette comes over, and he's got a fourteen-year-old wife that he left back in France. Of course, Thomas Jefferson starts having relations with, with uh, his uh, mulatto uh, uh, slave uh, when she's 14. So there is something about these founders that, uh, you know, they have to start families early and they're sort of virile men, a little older. Uh, and, uh, you know, family, I guess, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough and different kind of uh, society then, and they were no different. Thanks. Um, I wanted to um, also ask, so Marshall is an attorney, um, becomes Secretary of State, suddenly he's given, um, you know, this, this new position as well. What were his ambitions do you know like coming into kind of his his adulthood did he did he want to pursue becoming a, a judge something like that is that something that he was aiming for or was he hoping to be more of a, a quiet attorney do you know i think that he would rather have been president as many of them did you know uh uh short of being president of course he discussed he i think he discovered that there were other people in line for him. They were going to be president. And when he's offered this job as Supreme Court Chief Justice, who was the Secretary of State, which is pretty good in and of itself, right? He sees this opening to influence. 
And one thing about the founders is that they all left voluminous papers. And I think that the founders, or many of them, thought they were doing something worth leaving papers for and collecting papers. When Marshall actually writes the first uh, uh, biography of John, uh, George Washington, he was a great acolyte of George Washington. He would have, you know, uh, and, and the, the news of Washington's death comes to him in Congress. You know, the, 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 I don't know, Martha or whoever decided that that, that it was going to come to him. So, uh, uh, and his nephew, Bushrod Washington, believe it or not, uh, who was also a Supreme Court justice and was a friend of uh, Marshall's, decides that Marshall should write this biography. And, and it comes out, <laughs> they, they did, and so Philadelphia Publisher says, oh, we're gonna have this uh, uh, a subscription service, like Book of the Month Club, and uh, uh, there's gonna be at least three volumes. And uh, the, the people are paying per volume here and Marshall doesn't come up with anything for a couple of years. And so people start asking for their money back. But when he finally does come up with the first volume, it's this long volume. And it's not about Washington. It's about the history of America before Washington. You know? So he's writing a preface almost. And people are, I won't say they're outraged. We're not talking about, you know, somebody who was trying to put something over on him, but he was just late and, and and comes up with this and even John Adams who was a great friend writes this horrible review of of this tome which is sort of turgid if you want to read it but then what happens is one of the salesmen from this company is a guy named Mason Weems uh, and he was a, a he was a parson at one time so so often known as Parson Weems but he says I can do a better job to the publisher and the publisher says, all right, give it a try. And he's the guy who invents the cherry tree story and the wooden teeth story and whatever makes Washington into a hero. And it's not, it's not uh, marketed as a true story. It's marketed as a sort of, you know, mythological thing and how we should look at Washington. Some of it, of course, is true. And it sells 50,000 copies. Now, 50,000 doesn't seem like much. But remember, like I said, there's only 3 million people in the country. So 50,000, there's a lot of people buying it. And uh, it becomes what we know of Washington. Oh, you, excuse me, what ch children are told of Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, Marshall eventually does fill out his, uh, his uh, commission and he's kept the papers for so long that now the paper, now Washington's papers are full of like little tears and uh, mud stains and uh, sweat stains or whatever, because Mar uh, Marshall tended to take them around because he was always going to be working on this biography. No. James, as a as a publisher, how do you feel about that Parson Weems uh, yeah. <laughs> approach to uh, <laughs> to publishing history here? Well, I feel like fifty thousand is a good a good number to sell, but um, especially if and with three million people. But even even nowadays, it's it's good. It it, it all depends on what your your numbers are. Um, we we haven't talked about uh, quotes. Um, as a sports writer, you need to you need to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, well, Marshall was the uh, was sort of the the cheerleader of Valley Forge. Now we view Valley Forge as a really horrible thing where, where people were, were wearing rags and, 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 and bound to their feet and all. But uh, well, Valley Forge is not, I hate to say it, not as bad as we think it was. Most of the deaths were from disease and most of them were in the late winter and early spring, not in the middle of the winter. There, there, there were, those guys lived in huts and people did bring in food from other areas, but it wasn't wonderful. But so Marshall, who was a lieutenant, and you get to be a lieutenant by saying you're a lieutenant. And uh, so he's a young man and he's there and he's been an athlete. His father's trained him to be an athlete. By the way, Marshall went to one year of school. He was about 10 and his father sent him to a boarding school for one year, that's all. He studies law uh, for about five minutes, about five weeks, and that's it. So you can imagine, 
this guy who we see in this picture, this August picture, uh, writing uh, many, many, many Supreme Court uh, decisions, and among the most uh, most uh, uh, important, uh, uh, went to school for like not at all, almost. Anyway, but he does he does become an athlete, and uh, when he gets to uh, uh, Valley Forge, his mother has sent him stockings, white stockings to wear. And he figures, this is pretty good. You know, I'll, I'll wear them, I'll look more official. But he takes off his shoes to run and he's faster than anybody else. So they only see his, the end of his uh, uh, feet and they call him Silver Heels. So that's his nickname because he could run fast. And then there's another diary uh, uh, from another soldier who says he, he, uh, he would take a board and put it uh, on the tops of the heads of two soldiers and jump over it. So he was sort of the uh, Bruce Jenner of, uh, of uh, Valley Forge. But he would, he would have these games and, and he, would, he, would, he, would, uh, he would, he thought he was keeping the troops engaged and, and, and having a, as good a time as you can have. But the courts thing is that uh, it, for people who don't know what courts are, they're, <laughs> they're, they're like horseshoes uh, with, a, with a pole and the courts are, uh, now they're made of rubber and, and you throw over the, uh, you know, you get a ringer if you, you do that. And he became a quartz fanatic. And in Richmond, his home, he, he started the quartz club. And uh, in the quartz club, you could not talk politics. And if you talk politics, you were done for a case of champagne. So, uh, uh, you know, in, in any case, uh, this was his thing, you know, to, it was a social thing, but it was also a, a modicum of athletics. And uh, uh, it wasn't, it was exclusivity, I suppose, but, but not really. Anyway, when he died, the Coit's Club uh, said that they would never, uh, they would never fill out his, uh, his place there. And, and uh, perhaps uh, still, uh, uh, the, this uh, this club has mutated into some sort of social club. Uh, so uh, yeah, you know there, there 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 could have been sports writing back with the founders. You know, what one of uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge's uh, uh, favorite hobbies was throwing Indian clubs. I don't know where he threw them to. I mean, I guess you had, it was sort of might wasn't quite like juggling. You probably had to get them around a. A, a similar horseshoe-like or shuffleboard-like thing. We do have a question in the chat, uh, which I will read to you, and I will apologize if my Latin pronunciation is wrong, everyone. Um, okay. How can originalists claim to follow the written constitution when they overturn federal laws? I thought stare decisis wasn't an original part, so why does any originalist use this as a way to include Marbury de facto into constitutional law? Right. Well, <laughs> that's the thing about stare decisis. <laughs> it's not so starry and decisis. You know, uh, uh, we're, we're coming around to a possibility, though I would not say a, a probability. One of the things that I like to talk about as Supreme Court, uh, I, I think that uh, there's always the possibility that Roe versus Wade will be retried in some way. And, you know, there would be a large number of people if it were tied tried today, 50 years after its, uh, its uh, original decision, more or less 50 years, uh, and not to say that's not stare decisis, which means to, you know, the law can't be mutated. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Clarence Thomas does, and uh, Sam Alito do not really believe in, uh, in the, the theory of stare decisis. And, uh, uh, and originalists, you know, I find that so, you know, silly because the, the, the found, I'm sure the founders, every one of them never thought that this, well, a lot of them probably never thought the constitution would last more than a, a, a year and a half, but, but uh, they, they never thought that there wasn't going to be change in the country if they could look forward 200, 300 years. Uh, uh, so to, to be an originalist is, it's your own interpretation anyway. It's really, 
you know, I, I, I respect uh, what uh, uh, Edmund Scalia wrote, but it's, uh, you know, he wasn't, you know, I, I would like to see him go without indoor plumbing and, and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, symphony orchestras, which he loved. So that's, that, that's my feeling about originalists. <laughs> I think they're all sophists, somebody says. <laughs> that may be too. This is Princeton. I, I, I have not had sophists anywhere. You know, nobody's talked to me about sophists. I was a philosophy major in college, and, and uh, I thought it was good training for being a sports writer because you could argue every side of every of every decision, uh, and, and I do. You know, I like that approach. <laughs> we have another question here. I think that'll probably be either either our last or almost. Um, do you think that Marshall was the most important Chief Justice, uh, and who would rank as second? Yeah, of course he was the most important because, you know, I shouldn't say of course, but, but you know, just the same Washington as being the most important president. He started the stuff, you know, and, 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 this, uh, and uh, Marshall sort of started this stuff, and because he lasted so long, he was able to continue it. Most of his major decisions really flow out of Marbury versus Madison, in, in, in any case, all the I'll, I'll, I won't get into the names because it, it, it's sort of McCullough versus Maryland, Cohen's versus Virginia, Fletcher versus Beck. They're all decisions that 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 uh, make the federal government the most important thing and the separation of powers the most important thing. Uh, uh, second, I don't know. You know, it, it, you know the, if you want to have a signal case, something that really changed things for the positive, uh, it would probably be Brown versus Board of Education. And it's terribly ironic that uh, Earl Warren, who forced that decision to be a unanimous decision, was also the man as Attorney General of California who supervised the uh, internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II. So here's a man who, that's another great negative case, Karamatsu versus the United States, that uh, 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 justified this uh, uh, terrible thing. But, uh, but Warren really thought that this was a case that had to be won and it had to be a unanimous decision. And there's, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he got everybody to go on board with it. Uh, and, you know, it, it really is, things, things flow from that. Whatever, whatever we feel about uh, uh, racial justice flows from uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. It's been it's been great to to hear from you on these um, on these various aspects of uh, the Supreme Court as well as uh, these historical figures. Um, we're just about at the end. James, did you have any? Um, Final questions that you wanted to to sneak in here right before we say farewell. Oh gosh, um, there's there's so many. No, I don't I don't think uh, I don't think we have a time for a stress length answer. Um, but it was it was lovely to uh, to host us, and uh, I I will put in a, another plug for you to go to Labyrinth and support our local bookstore yes. and buy buy this wonderful book. Um, it's really fun. Uh, makes a good present too. Uh, for for history buffs in your life, so I would I would uh, rather than ask another question, I would uh, make a plea for uh, for for buying this book and supporting uh, your local bookstore. Right, and if you're doing this from some other place, if you're watching from some other place, and you don't go to Labyrinth, uh, try to try to go whether it's my book or anybody else's book. Try to go to a, a, a independent bookstore. Uh, you know, uh, I don't mean to speak against Je Jeff Bezos as a journalist because he, he did save the Washington Post, but as uh, Amazon has sort of taken over too much, and, and I want to see uh, local bookstores survive. Yes, we certainly love our locals, um, so please support them. I've put the, the labyrinth details in the chat. 
Um, thank you again both to Robert and James for being here tonight. This has been an excellent program. Um, and thank you again to the, the audience for all of your questions. Uh, we will say farewell. Have a lovely evening.